gang of four co-curators are very pleased to have you guys back. Many familiar faces, welcome to the ongoing conversation that is allowing us to figure out how to think of theater, transcend theater, do everything that comes from the roots that we all know as community um, into this great unrehearsed future. And today's talk is led by Moenia Kaboy. So I will leave it with her. Welcome one and all. Just quickly, if you go to the Drama School Mumbai's website and you look at Unrehearsed Futures there, you will see that every single talk is put up, the video recordings of, and Falguni, who runs these and holds space for us, writes these beautiful reported pieces, which are about three or four pages that kind of summarize, but with mindfulness and meaningfulness the conversation in case you don't have time to listen to the whole one hour conversation, you can read the, um, read the reported pieces. And there's a whole season of talks from last season and the season of talks from this season is now building up and becoming quite the body of knowledge. So leave it with you, Wenya, yeah, all yours. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Thanks so much for being here, everybody. Um, uh, particularly in light of everybody's COVID pandemic contexts. I know that um, many of us are taking immense strain under um, yeah, the, the demands of the pandemic in our homes and communities and with our students and colleagues. So I really want to just say that up front and thank you for making the time to be in community with us today. Um, so this, uh, those of you who have uh, been to these sessions before um, know that the, the four curators are questing in some kind of way. And through this questing, we have the honor and privilege of inviting our uh, friends and colleagues and networks to be in conversation about um, a range of things under how we uh, respond to these new and evolved and old circumstances we find ourselves in as practitioners, educators, artists, thinkers, all of it. Um, and so the conversation today has come about um, out of a particular quest of mine that um, is similar to Jehan's, I think, in that uh, I'm, I'm interested in how the skills and tools and techniques of theater and performance get uh, leveraged and adapted into a range of different settings. Um, and one step back from that, I find myself asking what, how to train, who to train, what kinds of legacies of training to think with and through. And then one step back from that, I think about um, how these legacies are identified, how they're adapted when they migrate from one context to another, um, how they're practiced, of course. And then a step back from there leads me to ask questions like, what exactly are we talking about when we put terms like decolonial and theater and performance and pedagogy together? So out of all of that musing, um, I have invited uh, two very dear friends of mine, Kyla and Manola, to be in conversation with us around this stuff um, and to help us think about decoloniality in our context, by example, if you will. Um, and this is through Kyla's work as one of the founders of a brand new, beautiful school called the Johannesburg School of Mask and Movement. And uh, many of the other co-founders are here as well. Um, and also through Manola's work as a somatic practitioner who works through a range of different feminist and decolonial pedagogic tools. And how we're thinking this is gonna go is that they will introduce each other and then I will open with the question to each of them. And then we'll open it out to the floor soon after that, and then come back together and they will ask each other a question. And then we'll open it back out to the floor. And we'll, that's the kind of loose format, but we'll also see how this goes. Again, those of you who have been know that it's like, you know, the idea is that we are thinking uh, in community and together. So at any point you have uh, a contribution to make a question, a comment, put it in the chat, raise your hand and we will We'll put it in the mix. So that format is really very loose. Um, yeah, that's that's my that's my preamble. So I'm going to ask Kyla Manola to introduce each other. 
and uh, maybe starting with Manola. Okay, so we, the topic is serious play. So we've started with a bit of play here and we've got each other to write little notes, which I'm going to read to you. I'm reading Kyla's note. I'm a theatre creator and a homemaker caring deeply about the earth and the interconnected relationships between people and ecosystems. I believe in a just transition to a more sustainable future where life, human and non-human, is valued about profit. I am moved by the potential for theatrical processes to inspire hearts, radicalize minds and mobilize hands towards a more empathetic and caring world. I am powerfully drawn to choral work. I enjoy experimenting with the endless possibilities for play within an ensemble where there are no leaders and no followers, but rather a hive mind of hyper-present performers. I also love to make masks and puppets to take outside and cause a ruckus. So, <laughs> thank you, Kyla. <laughs> thank you, Manola. <laughs> I wouldn't have anyone else introduce me. <laughs> it was beautiful. <laughs> and I will introduce Manola. Um, Manola is currently spending her time writing poetry, a play, an article on breath and trauma, teaching, analyzing dreams, whale watching, sea dipping as much as humanly possible, as well as co-holding the Matrixia space, uh, spaces for being amidst the pandemic these days. She likes talking to experimental traditional healers who enjoy working through performance in different ways and collaborating with vi visual artists and musicians and historians. She is inspired to continue to find new ways for our hybrid subjectivities to emerge and think, she thinks it's important for questions of decolonial interest and transformation to speak together. Lovely, welcome both of you, Devon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, great. So I want to um, ask, uh, start by asking Manola if you could um, kind of just open by uh, sharing some of the particular questions that you work with and through. And this is by way of setting up um, some loose guide posts and uh, framing within which this conversation can occur. Because of course there are a range of different ways we can come to this. So, so that's my, my opening question to you. If you could just, yeah, tell us what some of the key questions are that you have um, uh, churning at the moment in your work and in your practice. Okay, So I'm going to um, speak from what I, from the work that's happened over the last few years, but that's kind of coming together in a particular way this morning today here. And um, since we were talking about physical theater and then embodiment and then pedagogies and then thinking around the serious play, um, one of the questions linked deeply with the question of uh, decolonization is uh, the question of what happened as dehumanization and also then the dehumanizing of the body and the dehumanizing of the mind in various ways and uh, being extremely mindful of what Nlovo Gatsheni talks about that uh, the question of um, decoloniality outside of thinking about the politics of it needs to come in terms of the freedom of our epistemologies and the freedom of our thinking and the freedom of our knowledges. And this, so epistemic freedom almost necessarily involves new forms of knowledge and new ways of approaching that knowledge. And it's, um, it's my sort of strong, and I think a lot of us who believe that these knowledge forms have all, all read, already sit in the bodies of performers and performance traditions, especially in the South, in the global South, there are also philosophies tied in with those knowledges. And somehow, uh, somehow this epistemic freedom that's sought as part of the decolonial question is, is deeply linked with this relationship to practice in the body and finding a way to open up that cellular wisdom that belongs within tradition, but is also present in memory. And um, finding practices that unlock that, 
uh, to say that just in the context of questions of decoloniality, I like Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang's work that decolonization is not a metaphor. They, they say that we cannot talk about it in terms of academics only. You know, it is a question also of land, which for me come, comes back to bodies and how we see them. Uh, it comes back to uh, when you are, your work, Afro cartographies for me is deeply feminist, queer, decolonial in ways that I think it should it should work for me. That's another example uh, practice of the work, which I which I really love. Um, I think that the the question. I mean, uh, there are different inspirations, including uh, practitioners that I learned from Vinapani. Um, who said, you know, who, who in theater research and the laboratory is like, we can't go back to a past imagining it's pristine. We can't only look to the West, which is another move that happens. So kind of trying to look at a mix. I mean, so that was that whole, and, and I was curious and informed by her practice. I was informed by both Kanailal's coming back to the, to the, to the Manipuri body and Manipuri tradition in terms of kind of finding a practice which also linked him back to theater of the earth. Um, I'd like to kind of, yeah. And so these are, I think these different things, including just practices and healing wisdoms that also have performance sort of informed my, informed where I was trying to find space in theater and performance scholarship and drama training. I was like, how do I hold all these kinds of questions and come in? And uh, over the last two years, I think the question for me that sits very strongly is that one has to look at trauma and loss. And this for me again, has resonances for us in the pandemic and what happens with that loss of control. It's such an epic, huge scale. You know, it's epistemology is lost. It's connections to that that is lost. And that, that's in terms of colonization, but in terms of also just immediate memory and loss that the question of decolonization is tied, has to look at the relationship of trauma and loss and therefore the practices need to, need to hold how we work through trauma and loss. And that's part of what my work does, which moves into both embodied knowledges, which moves into spaces like the Matrixia uh, to try and, and believing that creativity and pleasure open up both the knowledges and allows for this new subjectivity to emerge. So that's um, in a sense, some of my background with that. And to say that, uh, when we say physical theater, we've discussed this in the in our preambles a lot, the nomenclature and the naming um, of both traditions and people. And, uh, you know, Amy also talked about, um, I think she mentioned Susan as coming up with certain, um, certain of the practices. I mean, she can say more about that, but kind of revealing some of those histories, which is one part of one kind of scholarship's work. But the other for, for me is also about just naming and where does, where does a practice sit in the practice and how important are names? The whole first conversation happened without me mentioning any of my teachers. Um, but connected to that in terms of saying physical theater is this other interest within academia, which is with taxonomies and classifications and how the cultures of the global South really escaped those. So you have scholars from each, from the continent saying, but you know, Sanskrit theater is actually dance drama, you know, and African theater is not just storytelling. And we have huge articles and scholarship work that uh, where, where the lens of even drama and theater is inadequate for these forms that are already mixing. So to just, to just I think if we're speaking about the languaging, I wonder, would, you know, would we call this really when you're making space for Manola to be curious about Kyla's relationship to Lecoq, you know, <laughs> like how do we name the talk, which for me is, is, is about making space coming from all our multiple histories for me comes back to the relational. Um, and which was why I was really excited when Kyla took me through like a Lecoq exercise on our first meeting. And that went into my body and opened up my spaces to listen. And um, which is what I did a little bit this morning again, before I came to sit here. Um, and to say that just as an offering that I do keep coming back to my breath and to my table and things outside the screen. Um, as I register that everything that we hold in our heads and talk, if we're not paying attention to what's happening to our body, creates, um, 
creates a stress. So I keep trying to come back to it as well. So I'm just doing that right now. And I'm going to pick up a brush and paint <laughs> and catch my breath while I um, listen to, to the next bit. Yeah. Thank you so much, Manola. Um, uh, I feel like the, the invitation to get your paintbrush and paint and your coloring pencils and your yoga mat out while this talk is happening is very wide open. It is anyway, but uh, it might be worth it to have that said upfront and explicitly. Um, beautiful, thank you. There's so many things there that um, we must circle back to as we proceed. Uh, Kyla, I want to ask you a similar question, actually, um, which is about um, what some of the questions are that you and your co-founders have been asking yourselves in these early stages of developing your new school. Thanks, Mwenya. Um, I'd like to also just start my um, little section with a couple of acknowledgements, if I may, because I think they're important. Um, I first of all want to acknowledge my uh, co-collaborators in, in the room, Daniel Buckland and Mlin Deli Zondi, and uh, Roberto Pombo, who's not in the room, sadly, he wishes he could be here. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my elders and teachers, some of whom are in the room, some of whom are not. Uh, in physical and movement theatre, uh, some even who I have not been taught by, <laughs> but I still consider elders um, and that I have learned this practice from. Um, it has come through them. Um, and then the last acknowledgement I want to make is that I am not a scholar in, um, in either decoloniality or uh, anything really. I'm not of the academic world. I'm a, a maker and a doer. Um, and, and this is how we come to the school really, is that my collaborators and I, um, led by, guided by Roberto, who, who trained uh, with Giovanni, who's also in the room. I see, I see him. <laughs> um, we, the, the school has been born out of a need to develop a, a, an ongoing uh, physical theater practice. So all of us have become really um, frustrated. We've been uh, collectively teaching for many decades now in various contexts. Uh, and all of those contexts have been quite bitty, you know? So just to give you an example, at WITS, I think the, the, um, the physical theater module is three weeks um, and it'll be situated depending where, and maybe when you, you could talk more to this, um, but uh, you know, I don't have intimate knowledge of the, of the curriculum, but my experience of teaching there and of having um, peers that have taught there and at other institutions is that it's, it's very sporadic and it's very bitty and it is very much a, um, an add-on um, to the curriculum. And often we get approached or have been in our, in our teaching experience to do a physical theater workshop. And then you're sort of expected to come in and uh, flex your physical theater muscles because you're a physical theater practitioner. Um, and it, it all feels and has felt quite a uh, surface. Uh, for, for over a decade now, I would say. And then coming from this training, we know that this work is not bitty or sporadic or surface. It really is a physical and emotional, spiritual even, some might say, possibly even therapeutic journey towards um, yourself and towards your, uh, the ensemble as well. Um, and so we really, uh, Daniel and I had tried to, to institute a kind of weekly uh, training session for theater professionals to come and move together and make things together. And we did that over several years. It was called Le Club and a performance came out of it called Swarm Theory, which we can talk a little bit about if there's time. Um, but still there was this thing of it being very much like a, a in between stuff. Um, and as and when. And I think um, 
the school has been born out of a, a desire and a, a need to to go deeper to to uh, to commit real time and real space and real thinking towards what a long term pedagogy looks like uh, in the South African context in terms of movement and mask theater. So I, I guess it, it has it, it has been born out of a, a dissatisfaction of just skimming the surface of this work. Um, so, I, I mean, in terms of how the school came together, Roberto uh, attended the Helicos um, and also did the, the, uh, the postgraduate pedagogical program and with the intention of coming back to Johannesburg and beginning some sort of training program. And because uh, Roberto and Daniel and I have worked frequently together on mask projects and other projects, we were sort of his first, his go-to people. And because Dan and I have worked a lot together in, in, in trying to gather a, a, an ensemble, a physical theater ensemble. So we were sort of his first stop. And Mlin Daly and I have worked together a lot as well over the years. And, and so I, I we, well, all of us were, were like, we need to bring this person in as well. So the school was formed thus. <laughs> and how it is going is that we are, um, we spent the COVID year meeting every week and going through the pedagogy and trying to bring ourselves onto the same page in terms of what it is we're actually speaking about. And we've really started with fundamentals like the 20 movements, for example, this is we began at the beginning. Um, and of course, it was it was uh, slightly dissatisfying, um, not, not that uh, fun to work on a physical theatre pedagogy online, but you know the the. Uh, um, what's the word the uh, circumstances dictated that we had to do that. And now the idea is that we're moving into uh, offering in-person workshops in small groups. Um, and those workshops will get longer and longer until we can offer a, a full year program. And I feel like I'm getting away a little bit from the question. So what questions are arising during this process? Sorry. Um, what questions are arising for us is, I mean, the, the biggest question and why I was very excited to be uh, invited by Mwenya to talk about this is our context, is where we are. Um, we started off by calling it the South African School of Mask and Movement Theatre, and then we felt that that was extremely um, uh, precocious and <laughs> um, presumptuous as well. And, and so we narrowed it down to the Johannesburg School of Mask and Movement Theatre. Um, but even that is, is sounded to us quite presumptuous, you know? So we, we really are in a process of acknowledging who we are uh, and where we are and where the uh, Manola has a, a lovely word for it, the, the lineage of this work is coming from. Um, I also have personally speaking a, a, a vested interest in the feminism of this work as well. Um, I mean, if we can just name it and say that this work as, as much as I love it and value it and it has formed me as both a human being and a maker, a theater maker, it is a predominantly white male European led practice, you know, um, with these almost guru like um, uh, teachers historically, or at least that's what it looks like from the outside to anyone who is approaching this work. So, so we are definitely tackling those kinds of perceptions that come up and acknowledging where we sit um, and, and, and what questions it's going to raise to start a school of this nature called the Johannesburg School of Mask and Movement Theatre run by these particular people. Um, yeah, I think I will leave it there. That, that, is, the, that is the biggest question. It's like, it's like uh, we, we, we have to acknowledge where we sit. Um, we are not starting a school in New York or Paris or London or Berlin which is a um, sort of uh, more of a crucible of international. I mean, we just, just think about the, the kinds of students that these schools traditionally draw to themselves. It's very international, you know, 
Whereas in Johannesburg, that's not going to be the case. Maybe one day we'll become world famous and everyone will say, oh, I want to go to the Johannesburg School of Mask and Movement Theater rather than Lecoq or Lispa or any of the other wonderful institutions um, that, that share so much knowledge, but they'll want to come to us and specifically for our flavor. And so I guess we're asking ourselves, what is that flavor? How do we um, plat these, these um, pedagogies together along with our context, along with who we are and what our bodies as South Africans bring. Let me leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. I love these metaphors on the table already, flavors and plating and makes me think of ice cream and getting my hair done. It's nice. Um, let's open it here. Let's, let's open it to the room. Um, and I want to ask if there are any general questions, comments um, uh, to the space, to each other, to Manola and Kyla. Um, other questions that are being thought through from the other co-founders of um, the new school. Um, yeah, anyone, does anyone have any contributions to make at this point? Things that are bubbling for them that they want to put on the table. I had a I had a question, I mean, uh, both an observation and a question because in the genesis of the drama school in Mumbai, I don't think we were nearly as mindful and thoughtful about, um, about who we are and what we're trying to do the way that you, you know, went from South Africa to Johannesburg. Um, a big question, and this is kind of uh, an observation because even from what Manola said, uh, I, I'd been to Adi Shakti, done the, done the source of performance energy work. We, we'd had worked with Tomba and Kanhailal from Manipur uh, a lot, they'd come to Bombay to do some of our, our sort of precursor workshops. And there was always this question about what is the flavor, what is the plats, what is the thread? And honestly, uh, I didn't have an answer. I just, at that point in time, it was just a very immediate need for formal, solid uh, theater training and some kind of pedagogical, you know, a rigor of, of, of training and understanding that theater is deep practice. Uh, and so we literally jumped into it and we brought all the ingredients to the table uh, and then decided what would, what this, we didn't decide what the stew would become. We just knew that we needed to, to be sustained and fed from it. So we threw everything into the pot. Um, it's come to bite us in the bum later on, because for example, at the beginning of the, of the, but it's also, it's a double-edged sword. It, it, it both acknowledges every single pedagogical lineage and the elders that have come and contributed to who we are. Um, but at the same time, it's not allowing us to... I'm very comfortable with the fact that we don't know who we are and we find out based on what has come out of it. And I don't know if that feels blasphemous in some way to, to be so <laughs> deliberately... Um, um, unconcerned by it, but uh, I, I think that, that that that's the observation, and I and I and I'm I'm more interested now actually because uh, I think of Mumbai as a crucible space like New York and London, etc. But I also realize that like in our school we've got all of these European theater pedagogies, we've got a, 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 a lot of the physical theater work. Um, it's all happening on bodies that are cosmopolitan bodies in India, in Mumbai, I guess. Uh, but uh, I lament the fact that we don't have some kind of a strand going back anymore to say Kanhailal's work or uh, the work in uh, say Kudiyattam from uh, uh, Venuji, for example. Uh, and these were things we were playing with in our, proto, in our prototype courses. Uh, how can we mix the tradition into the contemporary? How can we bring this in there? But uh, that has gone for sure. Uh, it's not there anymore, and I don't. I don't know. I don't quite know how I feel about that. Thank you. Thanks, Jehan. Any responses to that? Um, I have a response to that, and it's it, it's also uh, tying into what we, our conversation yesterday, um, Amy, Wenya, Manola, 
when we were talking about um, why Lecoq, why, and you, you, you mentioned mm. it in your intro as well, like why, why, why do we have to um, name it thus? Uh, and I said yesterday that um, it's, it's useful. It has been useful for us. That's why. Uh, not to worship at the shrine of uh, Lecoq or his uh, lineage, but to say um, this is a useful framework. Uh, it's, it's also a useful code for us um, as practitioners in, in, in that we can gather around this um, pedagogy, you know? So I hear what you're saying, Jahan. I, I understand. Um, I, I guess what I would want for the future of the school is, is the best of both of those worlds. I, I would like to be able to say, here is our journey that has already been tried and tested. And um, we as practitioners and as teachers have seen the, uh, the, the, um, the universality of it, how, how we can teach it in various contexts and also how powerful it is as a teaching tool. But at the same time, we cannot keep it in a um, pristine, you know, we can't, we can't treat it as the Bible. It has to, it has to move with us and work with us and we have to pull it apart. Um, we, we, when we uh, met with Giovanni, we talked, Mlin Deli had a question for him about African masks and where they fit um, in the pedagogy. And Giovanni was like, well, you're crazy not to, to, um, to put them in there, you know? <laughs> and we absolutely intend to, because again, where we are and who we are. So yeah, um, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. And I, I just wanna say that, I guess our hope is to um, take what we need and, uh, and, and use it as a scaffold from which to grow. I think my associative response to that, Jihan, and it strikes an extremely deep chord for me, uh, because in a sense, I suppose any of us um, from the Global South really grapple with the complexity of the lineage and how to visibilize it. And uh, the visibilizing of, of a lineage that, I mean, also coming, which we, we're not quite surely sure how much of it we actually inherit or really know to speak of. I mean, there's that question too, right? Like, when are you blessed by the guru to speak? Because you're not sometimes, but you have been informed by this. And I think the kind of deft move of the drama school to just claim the name of this is the drama school of Bombay or Mumbai and start and then sit seven years later with this, be in a space where you can um, sit with the complexity of the question uh, in terms of the pedagogy is, it sounds to me exactly what needs to happen and what needs to be done. For me, that's a, that's, that's a decolonial pedagogy question. It's not to answer it and then create a homage of lineages, but it is to say, but it is to sit maybe sometimes with what will stay as a discomfort because it's you cannot solve the problem of caste in a day but we it's impossible to not think about what what's happening to the dehumanized body in practice and if we're doing this as the drama school of mumbai you know like how do we hold it even if we cannot solve everything but how do we keep the space open and how does that show? And I think always in practice it does. There's, I mean, it shows in work, which is what keeps transforming, um, transforming us and our lives and our and the city itself. And to also say that when you when you spoke about this need that was felt, I also just think about Mumbai and you know the Bombay industry and about like the milling population of everyone in India that's there. And, and I think about how necessary it is to have this lab that is becomes at least like your practice becomes a space of uh, connection and of sanity and of making sense and not just feeling um, precarity and not just feeling, uh, you know, the existential crisis or what am I doing? Am I performing brilliantly? Am I the best actor in Bombay now? <laughs> uh, you know? But to have a community that's just kind of holding uh, in a sense, the emerging subjectivity of the contemporary performance practitioner. And I think to sit with some of that weight and that depth 
uh, including figuring out when can we call Tomba next for a sound thing, or how do we speak back to what Veena Pani has said or what somebody else said, or if an actor has come having done tal work for, for so much, you know, where does that pedagogy that's already in their body, how does, it, how does it find a language in? And of course, through exercises, it does. But for it to not just be personally dismissive, but to take on the epistemic weight of a lineage and legacy and how to, in a sense, create inside people the permission to do that. And that, that is, I think, the epistemic freedom that Nglovo Gacheni talks about. Where do you give yourself permission to visibilize and own your lineages and your legacies in the creative way that doesn't tie you to them, but allows you to be present to the becoming future, you know? So, yeah. Manola, can I ask you to share if you have a ready uh, link or something to pop in the chat, um, a reference to Gacheli and the work that you are, that you've been referencing? I can, I can, I can just put his name down. It's a book. Perfect. Uh, yeah. But I'll do that. Yeah, I can do that. Thank you. Lovely. Uh, does anyone else want to come in at this point? Thoughts, questions, things that are percolating for you? Resonances with your own teaching work? Mli, please. Uh, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, for me, most of all, um, to respond to the question that has been asked is that I'm looking at how Jacques Lecoq looks at the world and as a poet, as performers become a poet and very being, op uh, being observant to your own world. And that's where your first point of finding your own poetry to create work. And I realized that also coming from uh, your surroundings at South Africa. The question is, we always had between my, um, my my colleagues. We've been asking that. Yes, as much as uh, Jack Lacock is like very European kind of centered guy, uh, but uh, in his poetry, we, we we find a language and, and a universal kind of uh, a language that speaks throughout because somehow. His practice came after the World War II came into the place. And I can imagine how they were grappling of like reconstructing themselves as a community through the landscape of politics and economy and all that. I find that also in South Africa and in, in the state that we after post apartheid, we're still finding ourselves in that sense. And for me, the language is, is encoded that the body speaks and how you see the world is come as a, a coded form that is within a unique performer. I cannot move like uh, Kyla, I cannot move like Roberto, I can only move by myself. And somehow that is influenced by my surrounding and how I relate to the world. So we find like the coding, like we find lines into how we can express that. But now we have to find our own color and dimension into that through that is informed from our surroundings. So I'm actually looking at actually the, the ideas of rituals, you know, like um, ritual, as I practice rituals, the world is coming from like a closer guy, you know, and I'm, I was looking at how we look at the mosque that it can come into Africa that is like, they're very ritualistic. And how can we bring that as our own flavor? So we're constantly asking ourselves from the, our past, our present, and how we look at the world, the perspective, and try to find the universal link within that. And I think I'm, I, I was always drawn to the people who are practicing Chakla Cox, pedagogy and physical theater, uh, in the sense of like the work kind of draws you in and you start you start asking yourself what is it in in, in a sense and and then how it draws you in as a practitioner and that's how i go to the club and into finding and exploring those ideas so but the, the initial thing is that the coding of who you are and how you move uniquely brings uh, it gives you like a, a starting base of some sort then you start finding the code within that i don't know whether that makes sense if, if i can i can answer yeah. to that question so i'm, I'm yeah. thinking the answer to 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 the brother is that um also people who are coming to to practice in that school it's which is good that in the moment they didn't try and decide 
this is who we are, but also looking at the, the product that they practice and can give you a little glimpse within that because as teachers also you come in with your own code. You cannot teach the same, even if you're teaching something at uh, the same course, but the way we devise it, the way we deliver it to people is different. And I think that can be another code of looking at it. Okay, this is it. Um, I think I'll leave it there. I don't know what else to answer. Beautiful. Thank you. Kyla, were you going to come in? Thanks yeah, so there's, so, there's so much. I mean, in what Manola and Jehan and Lee have now said, first of all, I love this thing of, of just starting, just go. Um, that is exactly what I was trying to say with my acknowledgement that I'm not a scholar. I'm a, a, a maker and a doer. And I absolutely believe that these are, are things that cannot be figured out purely theoretically or intellectually. They, they've got to be uh, on the floor in collaboration with your body in that moment. So I love what you were saying there. Um, and I just I just wanted to share a little story that that maybe also can highlight um, the kinds of things that we've been talking about or that have come up rather in our conversations, which is about mask and the neutral mask and the idea of neutrality, which is kind of central to the Lecoq pedagogy. Um, and we're really having to confront that as a concept, you know, this idea of neutrality. I mean, for hundreds of years, neutral ballet shoes were pink, you know, and nobody ever thought about that until suddenly there were brown ballet shoes. And then it was like, well, <laughs> who's neutral? <laughs> and I know that there's, um, you know, that, that's a little bit of an oversimplification of the idea of neutral. It goes much deeper than that. And there are people in the room I see Giovanni and Norman, John, like incredible um, uh, teachers who can speak much more about neutrality and maybe they want to, but we've been talking about this in terms of, do we even call it the neutral mask? Um, and Roberto was like, no, I think we should call it the silent mask because just the term neutral mask is enough to be quite triggering, I think, in our context. Um, or the, 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 the the quest, I mean, Mli was talking, I guess I'm, I'm thinking of this because Mli was talking about how nobody moves like anybody else. You only move as yourself. And, and what we are doing here is not trying to um, sculpt little uh, homogenized chorus of drones. We are trying to um, make space for uh, performers to emerge with their own poetic voice or their own um, theatrical voice as their own makers of their own things. Um, and so, so we have to look very carefully at the idea of neutrality in that. And, and um, I mean, just the, we, we've had a long discussion recently about the mask itself, you know, is it a very Eurocentric mask? Um, and we don't have answers. It's it's <laughs> it's an ongoing conversation. Um, I wish Roberto was here to talk a little bit to that. But I think that probably, and please correct me if I'm wrong. I wonder if those kinds of conversations are that have had be, have been had in more um, global north classrooms, Lecoq classrooms, or you know, we we're needing to have those conversations now because we are on the move. We are on the move with this thing, and these these questions are coming up. We are being confronted with them, and so we must delve in. Can, can I say something? Can yeah. Please go ahead. It's, it's, yeah. it's great. It's great that the neutral mask. That's what we say. The twenty movements. That's what we say. The question I have is: Do we each have our twenty movements? Do we each have our own neutral mask? And then you, it's coming right back: the silent mask. The neutral is a very unfortunate term, right? And I tried to call it a few years. A few years, a few years ago. Yes, here I am. I, I get into RP English occasionally because I know where we come from. I know where I come from. I come from the lower classes in England, right? I know, and it just back, bashes back to me occasionally. Uh, you see that I tried to call it the mask of reference once, and then people said, "What the is that?" You see, I said neutral mask. Oh, neutral mask. Okay, All right. So I tried to get towards, like you say, the silent mask. Yes, but it's a silence that really resonates, resonates, 
Uh, you can be silent if you have nothing to say, right? You know, someone who doesn't say anything either has everything to say or nothing to say. You know that. So uh, even the word silent, it has a resonance if it's referential. So it's a, it's a very potent term for that mask. Um, the neutral mask, is it European? Well, I guess the ones we use are very European. You know, I, I had a great, a great conflict because I was asked to go to Beijing and do a neutral mask class. I, and they said to me, can you bring neutral masks? And I said, well, yeah, but there's no point, is there? You see, because <laughs> you um, and the the discussion. This discussion is absolutely essential, vital, and phenomenal. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to say anything against what you say, or what is being said, because it is very important to say it. And, you know, the, if, you, if you are worth what you do, and not necessarily what you are, if you're worth what you do, then it is inevitably universal. So I'm trying to get back to this, the, the idea of neutrality. I love that term, the idea of neutrality, because it is only an idea. It is only a reference. We can never be neutral. Is that we can't. And if you do one of these exercises or a uh, uh, Lecoq exercise, you know, if Giovanni Fusetti leads a class, you know, and, and we do the exercise, I prefer to think of it as a Fusetti exercise, right? Because I remember Lecoq saying in a class to a student, don't move like I move, move like you move. Right? So he was within this universality. I'm not saying anything against this discussion because it is absolutely vital. Yeah? And what do you call your school? Well, why not African school, South African school, Johannesburg? You know, everything has to be situated somewhere. Now I'm going on. I had a, a clear line of thought through neutrality, and now whoop, 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 it's coming out in all sorts of in all sorts of ways. And so um, the silent mask, the neutral mask, I called it the referential, the mask of reference. How do we call it? And do we each have our own neutral mask? That's the question in my head at the moment. You see, now there would be how many billions of neutral masks? And there wouldn't be the neutral mask. I tend to talk about neutral mask, masks, because each, each mask maker has their own way of viewing the world, viewing neutrality. And who said, how do we see the world? How do we see the world? I don't know. I wrote it down. How do we see? Oh, yeah. How do we see the world? Right? We look at it, but can we see it? And the neutral mask, the silent mask, the mask of reference, or calm and harmony can help us or give us methods of seeing the world, of being able to look at it anyway. Uh, I'm going around the houses now, but it is absolutely vital, this discussion, and it um, resonates deeply within me because I was always against this de decolonization. Decolonization. <laughs> decolonization. Um, because, I, in a sense, I say, well, why bother? Why bother? But I surely and sincerely understand why we bother. Because there's these two things. You do your own thing. Yes, there is the, the, that pedagogy, that method gives us, can give us a way of exploring the world and ourselves. Life can be pedagogical. Life can teach us about ourselves and about the world. You see that, and and um, oh dear, I better I better sign off. But another thing, you see, uh, Western European, white Western European, yes, that's what it was. But one of the twenty movements, I, I'm a little bit against the twenty movements. Right, you see, I'm a bit against that. I am totally against gurus. And you to talked about gurus, you know. Why? Well, you know, uh, gurus have nothing to say, in fact. So you, you, uh, I was brought up part in May 68 in Paris, you see, where there is um, no gods and no masters. There are no gods. There are no masters. If you need a master, well, that's your problem. What? And some of us do, and I needed one, you know. 
and perhaps he still is, but see, and, and, and the movements, the, mo the, the mouvement de masse is the French word for a term for that. And I have heard it called the, the Indian club swing. It's the Indian clubs for us, <laughs> if you're British, you see. <laughs> right? Hello. And so, uh, you, know, you, you know the exercise. I just happen to have, hang on, 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 don't go away, don't go away. So you're doing a demonstration for us, Norman. <laughs> and in French, it's called the Massive Club. And in British, in my generation, we tend to call Indie Club. So that, you know, it is universal. I better stop, otherwise, once I start talking. So Thanks, it's Norman. Michael, sorry. Thank you, no, I was saying thank you so much. But since you have paused, let's... Uh, John has got a question and there's some lovely things in the chat. Uh, please respond also this conversation can happen there. And I also want to pull it back to the question that Kyla and Manola have for each other. Um, uh, can we take uh, John's question? And then there's also something in the chat that Amy has put in about trauma and loss and violence that's directed to Manola. So I'd love to not lose that thread either. Um, John, come on in. Uh, thank you, thanks. Um... I, I'm interested in, so I'm coming from a perspective of uh, Western European in London. London's been mentioned. It's very interesting the the perspectives that some of the contributors um, were bringing to that, the idea of London. Kyla, you were talking about the naming of your school and so on. And, and we had this thing about the naming of our school, London Clown School, and the, 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 the symbolism around it and who might be in that school at the time of pre-COVID. Um, basically people who are passing through um, the metropolis and, and very diverse. But um, I'm really interested to know more um, about what seem to be very positive takes on Lecoq coming from the global south. And, and I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm really surprised in a very positive way um, because I've got used to out here where I am, um, our, our kind of thoughts on decolonizing our practices um, are, are pretty negative about that legacy um, because what we see, um, and this is from a white um, male uh, European perspective, uh, is, a, is an ideology of individualism, um, uniqueness, everyone is different yet universal, blah, 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 which is kind of the ideal, ideology that underpins colonialism in the first place. Um, and in my field, which is clowning, which is a little subsection of all of this, um, particularly the emphasis on vulnerability and the personal, um, which we, which we, I say we, because talking with a lot of colleagues um, here in the North and, and in North America as well, as well as Europe, um, our concerns are as a pedagogy, which works fine for the white European well-armored actor, um, but as vulnerability is understood as something which you reveal something of yourself in the in the workshop in the studio and then you go out back into the real world and you're fine you have nothing to fear because you're in a very privileged position um, and and this is very exclusionary assumption that we can all come into the studio and be vulnerable with each other and be ourselves and be unique and um, show our true selves and then somehow go back into the world and everything's fine and that just isn't true so that's our kind of struggle at the moment to to grapple with um dismantling that privilege so so i'm i'm so my question is um does that make any sense to some of the, your contributors or is that purely a very perhaps a very um th that we're stuck in this we're trying to examine our our history um here there's sort of one of the sources of the of colonialism um, or is, is, does that resonate or is that just our, our little battle? And, and also I'd like very much to hear more positive outlooks on taking Lecoq legacy forward. Manola, Kyla, either of you want to um, respond? Um, do you want to, uh, shall I respond to John specifically and then we can go to Manola, the question for Manola in the chat. Um, is, is that okay with you, Manola? Great. Yeah. Because I, I do have a lot to say about that. Um, and, and in fact, I, I always found in my training, which was in London, um, and um, touches a little bit on, on what Norman was saying now, this idea of the individual, 
Um, yeah, th this is something that I personally really would like to pick apart. And and in answer to your question, you you you're surprised at the positive um, response to the Lecoq pedagogy in the global south. Um, all I can say to that is I feel like it's our turn to be given an opportunity to pick it apart. Um, I feel like there has not been, I mean, with, a, 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 and, and, I, and I want to make reference to this a little bit later, but I'll, I'll say her name now, Jenny Resnick and Magna Theatre in Cape Town, um, with the exception of, of those guys who've been going for decades now, and I think is the closest to the kind of school that we wish to build, with the exception of that, and possibly the lab in some respects, there, there hasn't been anything um, like this as, uh, that I'm aware of, um, certainly not in Johannesburg. So I really feel like it's our, it's our um, we, we want to have a go at it, you know, <laughs> and then let see how we end up. But at the moment, it's still this thing that draws us together and that that we find value in. So I think uh, that's the an, uh, part of an answer to your question. And the second part is there's absolutely, I always felt um, a, a huge gap uh, in terms of um, a choral work and ensemble work in the Lecoq pedagogy. It always seemed to me to be, maybe it was just my training, but I, I feel like at our school, we will be focusing a lot because I think that is a, a real difference between uh, Western societies and um, let me say South African society is this idea of the individual versus the community or the collective or the the idea that I am because you are, you know, so I think that this is very much something that we will be looking at in depth in our pedagogy. Dan and I have a particular interest in um, uh, choral work, having worked on a piece called Swarm Theory, and, and I feel like this, this is some, somewhere where the pedagogy does fall a bit flat, and I would like to look at that in more depth with much interest. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you, Kyla. Manola, did you want to come in? Yes, I think uh, to respond back again associatively to the mix of questions as well as what I just saw, um, <laughs> just been kind of giggling about, you know, the flavor, because it's like, what's a South African flavor? What's a London flavor? Because <laughs> there was, I mean, just there's that, there's the idea of the flavor. And of course, in Rasa that it's gut and, you know, that it's actually a lot more than flavor. There's, because the flavor is in the gut and that's the intestine. And there's just a lot of, a lot more shit going on there. <laughs> like literally and figuratively <laughs> than just this sort of ethereal thing that's in your nose and in your mouth. It's, it's intense. It's, and literally there's a lot of it that's quite shitty. So, <laughs> Um, in the mix as well, or that's processing what one keeps and what one processing essence in, in multiple ways. And uh, wondering about, because I think something that emerged also was that how does one go look at something as an entry point rather than even as a flavor? So where where is this common relational uh, meeting point of Lecoq for the four founders, an entry point into into this question of pedagogy, you know, rather than uh, deciding what is that legacy. So that it's just a question around, and I like the entry point as flavor because it still sits on your tongue, but then it goes down. It enters more than the tongue. It goes back into the body. It goes back into everything else that must be rigorously dealt with um, and worked with through the body. And the neutral body, I wanted to, uh, to respond back to that and to this question of neutrality, because when I started my research work on breath, it's because I thought that would be the most neutral thing to work with bodies anyway. I mean, that was my, very, what, what, apart from wanting to look at the connection of body and mind, the other thing was like, it doesn't matter where I go in the world, everybody's going to have breath, you know? So it was, there was definitely an interest in that. And Kanailal also wanted to, was interested in the earth and the neutral body. And um, he said, well, you know, whatever we say about everything else, we are flesh, we have a relationship to the earth and that can't change and those things, except to say that actually the breath is contextual. It depends if you're sick, it depends if you're on the mountain, if you're, it depends if you're a mother singing while carrying a child on your back on the mountain. Context is so important There's, um, for, for any, for any body. <laughs> 
Um, and I think coming back to the to these relationships in some elemental fundamental ways um, is, 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 is I suppose a part of the work and part of the practice. And it connects me to, uh, it connects me when I'm thinking about the collective to Haisnam Sabitri, who was, who's Kanailal's partner and performer and actress and trainer. And Kanailal developed also a pedagogy and a training method. You know, there's movement, there's breath work, there's eye work, there's all of that. And there's, so there's the Kalakshetra training style. And then there's Ima and I went to look at how they worked with breath. And I think in my third visit there, and I, and I was spending weeks and weeks and weeks living then. And I think in one of my final things, she sat with me and she could just see me trying to find what I was calling the cre creative autonomy. And she said, uh, Gayatri, sans kaha kaha akele dundo, which is to say, she said, uh, Gayatri, look for your breath alone look where it is, look where it goes, you know, uh, look for it on your own. And uh, I mentioned Kanailal's training because Kanailal then told me, Sabitri doesn't attend any of the trainings. She's not part of any of the sessions. She's constantly playing. She's in the bedroom on the back, on her back, trying this, trying that. There's a lot, there's a constancy of play. And this connects me to decolonial pedagogies around both intuition and solitude and developing, uh, as Jihan said, that the permission of the internal voice to cohere. And that one does that, and it, it can be a lonely practice, and that's part of the work. It's part of, it's part of the work uh, to do that. And um, uh, yeah, and then I suppose come back to how does that come back to synchronicity and other things. And um, Amy, um, yes, absolutely, the rhizomatic, um, I think, when when this when the idea of the matrixia is co-developing you know when um, Deleuze speaks about the rhizome it's in terms of a, it's in terms of a structure and and yes that's true there is that sense of the rhizomatic which is to say it's like a ginger formation you know it's not just a tree going up it's it's going in multiple directions and that's what that's what we're structurally saying when we say rhizomatic. But, um, but I guess in embodied practice, and this what's also happening is that one's aware that the rhizome is also sensual. It's relational to the other bodies and the other thoughts and the things coming up inside. So perhaps that's, and I love the word that you use there, radiance, uh, because it is connected to that, uh, that the, the livingness of the rhizome in, in, the, in, in this kind of work is, is I think what, opens up the possibility for the radiance. Um, and to touch back to Jihan not knowing whether we name or not, and, I, and, and it's still difficult to know how and when we name what, or if we just sit sometimes in, in the radiance of that performative utterance at that time, which actually has multiple things um, activating in the present body. So um, that's sort of my response to that, I think. And, I'm hoping it's touched on 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 the things, yeah, yeah. Beautiful, oh, thank you. Many, yes, one, one Go. response, I think, very specifically to what John was saying, and this again, mm. I I spoke about, um, I think, in one of the pre questions with Amy, is that I think. So I said that a lot of us practitioners are not in, are actually not even interested in the in the word decolonial so much because it keeps us in a dialectical lock with the colonial. And at the same time, uh, discursively and in other ways, it's being informed by that. But the practice is the is the next par is another paradigm. I mean, but we're also many of us artistic researchers or performances researchers, and also that the global south performance practitioner scholars uh, work that could be seen as decolonial is a different kind of work of opening up the third space. Whereas maybe in the global north. Part of the decolonial work is to is to go and re-examine scholar re-examine practice and scholarship. For me, it makes no sense to do that. You know, it's not. I mean, I don't want to either pull down like cock or bring him up. I mean, that's not not the interest. I'm interested again in 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 uh, Kyla's relationship to Le Coq and how it's opening up something in South Africa right now. That's exciting for me, and and I value the legacy and the work and and Susan, as Amy mentioned, and all the other contributors and the unpacking that's rich, that's feminist, that must happen, but uh, that maybe that 
given context, given political histories, um, the work of decoloniality is different for different scholars and for the different contexts as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Manola. Beautiful. Um, Jan has just put in the chat that isn't the global north in a dialect, dialectic relationship with the global south. Um, can I quickly make a response back to that by just evoking Eve Tuck and Wayne Young here when they say that decolonization is not a metaphor. And I think this connects back to land, it connects back to resources, it connects back to how global economics work. And that's an, that's an important thing that you cannot decontextualize either. Um, uh, you know, and I, and I, so the fact that I'm okay with Wenya introducing me as a decolonial scholar is also to kind of recognize the nuance but not be limited by that. A lot of my, pra the, my co thinkers and practitioners emerge from everywhere, but there is something specific about the global North. There is something specific about the global South. What's available, what's not available, what's available in terms of legacy to a white South African, what's available in legacy to a Hossa South African, you know? And I think these are, um, it. so for me, the, <laughs> the universal cannot come with the dismissal of the context <laughs> and, the, mm -hmm. and, and the rest, including that. Mm -hmm. So we have just over five minutes left of the formal session and then as you know if you've been here before there's an after party so this conversation can must and can continue once the recording has stopped but while we're still going in this formal time um, I really want to give uh, Kyla and Manola an opportunity to ask each other their questions and maybe it'll come with a, a brief response before we close formally and then we can go into a bit more detail after, um, uh, after quarter past. Can we go there? Kana, do you want to start? Sure. Oh, I've got so much going on in my head. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's so much going on in the chat. And there's so, and I just, I just want to talk to Melissa. I want to talk to, I want to talk to Manola. Oh, anyway, let me not waste time. Um, so uh, I, I guess I've, uh, not a question, a provocation or a, a point of departure, just like this conversation I think has been. Um, which is that I think um, wherever we uh, diverge in our thinking or which I don't think is actually very much, but, but certainly somewhere where we uh, meet very strongly in my experience with you so far is at the body. And I love how you've spoken about beginning with something simple, simple but complex like the breath, uh, this idea that everybody breathes. And I have um, the same feeling with the spine. This is where I begin. Um, when my, the first scan that I had um, of my pregnancy, of my, my child, I, this is the thing that struck me the most was this little spine inside me. And when we, you asked me to share some of my practice, instantly for me, what came what came to me was the undulation that we did together and even this conversation in a sense um the poetic the poeticism of the undulation this idea of an unfolding that that one thing has to come after the next in in um it's consequential you know um it it seems jarring to start with the head if the action has started in the knees um and i guess i my provocation or my, my um, I would love to discuss that. And I think it does touch on the, the body as um, a site of healing as well. Lee mentioned that Lecoq has come from, came from after the second world war, um, uh, 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 bodies in trauma. Jenny Resnick, who will put her MA thesis in the, um, uh, in the chat, but she also talks about this idea of, um, if I can just read it quickly, very quickly, I don't want to paraphrase it. Um, I, um, I argue that my own practice, influenced by my two years of study at Jacques Lecoq, continued this tradition by responding to what I propose existed as a culture of violence in South Africa from the period of colonialism through the apartheid era. So she was also coming to this work as a response to a culture of violence on the body. So I would love to, for you to speak to that um, and to, to speak to how we can meet 
at the body as a potential site of healing and under understanding ourselves better? Um, to say that I, I think we, we did meet and we're sort of still in the meeting. And um, I guess my response is to say that the, is that there is a hope of the meeting um, and the moving away and coming back that continues, um, that, it, that it does continue, that um, things that opened up, opened the conversation, even in this last hour, things that were dropped into my body, things that went into my mind, but are now sitting in different parts of my body. This will inform my practice. It'll inform uh, the language that emerges from me. And if there's a moment when we meet again, uh, in terms of, I'm not going to respond to this in terms of the larger question of what is the framework of addressing the body and trauma, because that's really a second talk and we can go there. But thinking about the time we have now, I think this is what I'm saying that in trauma work, I think what we really know is the question of boundaries and openness. So it's like, when do we open? Uh, and Iri Gray, whom I love a lot, thinks of space as not what's contained, but space is actually what happens when one opens up, when actually boundaries open up. And yet we know in trauma work that containment and the skin and the body is a certain kind of container. And how do we listen to the internal this is the amount of provocation I can take. This is the amount of stimulation I can take. This is the work I can do now in this minute. When do I pause? When is enough? When is enough for this? I will not complete it. We're not going to solve this, but is it enough for this hour, for this minute, you know, that this body can do this much now and uh, sit in some peace with that. For me, the question of decolonial, both erotics and desire is around also the question of when is it enough, you know, so. This is a perfect place to pause so that we can formally say deep thanks and then continue as soon as the recording is ended. So I just want to say that both of you, all of you, thank you so much for this incredibly rich beginning of an undulating conversation. Um, and yes, as you say, it feels like it could be the first of a whole series alone. There, there's lots of stuff in the chat to continue to respond to. Um, uh, maybe we can quickly talk about what is coming up next, next week's Unrehearsed Futures and the week after that. Um, I don't know who's next on the lineup, Mbongeni or Amy. I am. Jay Han, go for it. Do you want to introduce your your topic um, for next week? No, thank you. Um, embarrassingly, I've actually forgotten the precise title <laughs> for next week. Um, <laughs> but it's going to be in some ways a continuation of today's conversation. Um, we've been talking about Lecoq today and that kind of inheritance. Um, we're interested in thinking about what it means to conceive of something that we might begin calling a classical African drama. Um, so on the one hand, we're looking at how, you know, um, emerging forms are engaging with these legacies and histories of, of Western form and Western stories and fascinations with what we get, right, with, with, with the West, right, and the global North, um, but also how we can kind of crack apart those, those um, kind of embedded structures and, and, and fascinations within um, the dramatic form to imagine what we might call a decolonial drama what you might think of perhaps as a decolonial aesthetics of the dramatic. Um, and I'm using a lot of rising inflections <laughs> because um, I'm trying to kind of reflect the anxiety with the use of even, of, even those terms, right? Um, yeah, so thank you for this beautiful conversation today. And, and it certainly whet my appetite for um, the continuation, I guess, of this thread um, in next week's conversation. So I'll be with uh, Manjan Bote and with uh, Mark Fleischmann. I mean, we now two key interlocutors. I look forward to seeing that's, all of you there. That's perfect. And that's I'm perfect. going to, and I'm going to take that thread even further. And I'm really going to solidly request uh, if Manola and Kyla could rejoin us for that for sure. Mm. Uh, and uh, Tushar, who's uh, an, uh, uh, 
Tushar, who's both an alumni of the Drama School Mumbai and has experienced the training of the people, uh, of the teacher involved, uh, Shankar Venkateshwaran. Um, and the reason is that one of my quests is exactly this, is like, uh, how do we negotiate between like the universal and the individual? Um, how does, how does um, Kanhayalal's work coexist in the same space as uh, Benjamin Samuel, who is right here? And I think I will start that talk with a small story uh, uh, two weeks from now of what uh, gave us the internal permission to go ahead and uh, say, okay, we're going to start a drama school Mumbai without even knowing uh, who's going to teach what at it. Uh, and it was a moment, it was a eureka moment where Shankar was present, Ben Samuels was present, uh, Tushar, was, uh, Tushar was present at a previous version of it. Uh, and it came around the idea of the Lecoq Otoko. Um, and so uh, Shankar has moved on in his deep intercultural practice to, to almost say there are no universal truths anymore. Um, and I'm going to let him challenge me heavily. And I'm hoping that everyone over here will be part of that conversation because this for me is part of a quest to see if we can have a rhizomatic uh, drama school, a planetary drama school, uh, a school that has, uh, and uh, Amy and I have spoken about this, but this idea of a banyan tree uh, canopy with roots coming down at different places. So there is this ethereal in the sky thing, but then there are these rooted things as well. Um, and how can this coexist so, uh, so that, you know, there are 20 sites across the planet looking at neutrality, but each one is unique, but yet it's a quest for the same thing, or is it? I don't know. Um, so <laughs> that really is the that really is the conversation that I'm going to uh, very very uh, pursue very hard with Shankar uh, two weeks from now. And I think I'm so looking forward to adding to the thread that Ngeni is going to take forward right now. So really, let's have an ongoing conversation and see you guys mm -hmm. both next week and week after next. Uh, and uh, one more thing, I don't know if Moenia was, was going to say that, but um, we're happy to have you guys come in and buddy curate with us. And if there are people you want to speak to, if there are people you want to throw into conversation with each other and think that it would add to this ongoing conversation, just email any one of us. Uh, I'm going to put my email in the box, but I'm sure everyone else is going to as well. Uh, and uh, 